The National Institutes of Health, our nation's medical research agency, started as a one-room laboratory in 1887. The hygienic laboratory, as it was called, was part of the Marine Hospital Service. It was founded right as germ theory was taking off. That's the idea that microbes cause disease. By the turn of the century, its mandate was to investigate infectious and contagious diseases and matters pertaining to the public health. But the lab gained new importance in 1902. Until then, vaccines and other biologically derived treatments weren't regulated. At the time, the smallpox vaccine that I spoke about in episode one was being produced on small farms, with manufacturers harvesting cowpox pus from infected cattle. Similarly, the diphtheria antitoxin that I mentioned in episode two was made from the blood of horses without any governmental oversight. Sadly, batches of smallpox vaccine and diphtheria antitoxin from different manufacturers became contaminated with tetanus, and 22 children died. So the government created the Biologics Control Act and charged the hygienic laboratory with regulating the production of all biologically derived medicines. The Biologics Control Act was the first step towards making vaccines the highly tested and monitored substances they are. Today, the Food and Drug Administration is responsible for overseeing vaccines, but the NIH is still home to a multidisciplinary vaccine research lab. So it seems fitting that we go there to learn about how we know vaccines are safe. Anthony Fauci is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH. So safety is absolutely paramount when you're dealing with vaccines, even more so than with drugs that you're giving someone who really needs the drug because they're sick. Any new vaccine is first tested in animals before it's ever given to people. Then it goes through multiple rounds of human trials. And you get a group of people who are volunteers who understand that this is a first in human study. And you usually do it with a very small number of individuals measured in 10, 15, 20, 30, sometimes more than that, but not hundreds and hundreds of people. And what you do is that you vaccinate the person and you watch both for immediate and intermediate effects. This first test is just for safety. Then you do another safety test with a few hundred people. But this time, you also see if the vaccine is stimulating the immune system the same way the germ would. And then you get to the largest study, which involves thousands of people, to determine if it actually does protect you. The number of people in that final test is based on the actual risk of getting a disease. If it's an uncommon disease, you may need tens of thousands of people to tell if it's effective. If you're in the middle of an outbreak, you may only need a few thousand, since so many people will encounter the disease. And that's why vaccine testing is so different in so many ways from testing whether a drug works on someone who's sick. Because what you do is you have 50 people who are sick. You give them this drug. I mean, all of them are either gonna respond or not gonna respond. Whereas when you're testing a vaccine, you're gonna be vaccinating somebody, but they have to get exposed to the virus in order to determine if the vaccine protected them. And you certainly don't wanna be getting somebody sick deliberately unless you do it under very special types of circumstances. It's only after these first three rounds of studies that the Food and Drug Administration will license the vaccine or allow it to be given to the general population. If they notice any issues with the data, they'll send it back for more testing. I think one thing that certain people worry about, not just with vaccines, but about any sort of drug they take, is about like long-term effects. Right. And how do scientists kind right. of gauge whether there's gonna be a long-term effect sure. from any drug, but vaccines in particular? Yeah. Those are called phase four studies. Four is sort of like a post-approval where you observe cohorts of people. That means you look at large groups of people who've either gotten or not gotten the vaccine and see if there's any difference in their health. For example, you might have heard the rumor that vaccines cause autism. That claim is based on a single paper that was later retracted and included fraudulent data. Multiple phase four studies performed by institutions around the world have since looked into this, and none have found a link between autism and the measles vaccine. 
scientists looked at large numbers of kids who either got the measles vaccine or didn't, and they saw no difference in the rates of autism. In the US alone, we have four systems in place to monitor vaccines after they've been licensed. Of course, no pharmaceutical we take is completely without risk, even common drugs like ibuprofen or aspirin. But in order for a vaccine to be approved, the risks need to be very rare and far less harmful than getting the disease the vaccine protects against. Take the measles vaccine. The most common side effects are a mild rash, joint stiffness, fever, or some pain at the injection site. But there are very rare cases of more severe effects. According to the CDC, one in three to 4,000 children under seven may have a fever-related seizure, one that doesn't cause any long-term problems. Around one in 40,000 children may temporarily develop a condition where they bleed or bruise excessively. And in all the decades we've been using the measles vaccine, there has been one confirmed case of brain swelling caused by the vaccine in a patient who had a weakened immune system. The thing to note is that all of these more severe side effects are also caused by getting measles itself. Now, compare those rare side effects to the risks of actually getting measles. Prior to the vaccination being available throughout the world, there were about two to three million deaths per year from measles. In the US alone, there were an estimated three to four million cases per year. There are about a thousand cases of encephalitis, which is brain swelling and there are about 50,000 hospitalizations. One out of 10 children who get measles will get an ear infection that can lead to deafness. One out of 20 will get a pneumonia, which can be very, very serious. And one out of 1,000 or so could actually be serious enough to die. A lot of friends of mine um, who have had babies recently have um, balked at the number of shots their yeah. babies have to get at one time. What would you tell those people? Yeah, what people don't understand that if you look at the number of antigens, which are products of a particular microbe in question, the number of antigens you get exposed to when you get one of the many common infections in childhood dwarf the number of antigens in a single shot of a vaccine. So just the natural exposure in the environment expose you to so many more antigens than you would get if you get the recommended vaccine menu that you're recommending for children. The reason for getting so many shots at one time is simple. Why bring your baby back to the doctor more than necessary? If you forget or simply can't bring your child back, you leave them vulnerable to infection. Now, I understand that as a parent, it's easy to look around and say, well, I've never seen measles or diphtheria or polio. Why give my kid a shot for a disease they're unlikely to get? Well, again, take measles. We eliminated measles in the United States in the year 2000. But yet, since there's measles throughout the world, in 2017, I think 110,000 people died of measles. People continually travel back and forth. I mean, getting on a plane, feeling okay, and then all of a sudden starting to feel sick and then spreading it. So if society is not protected, then you get the outbreak. But when you're in society and you say, wait a minute, there's no measles, there's no polio, there's no this, why do I need those vaccinations? Uh, you need them because it will come back. And we were so successful with vaccinations that we've created a situation among some people who look around and don't see any incentive to get vaccinated. We have benefited from two centuries of successful vaccination campaigns, and the world is a safer place for it. But today, the World Health Organization has deemed vaccine hesitancy a threat to global health. We could eliminate some of the worst diseases ever to plague humans, not just from the US, but around the world. Will we do it?